Good morning, everyone. Wow, it's bright here. After sitting here in the, in the nice dark side, this is quite a change. So my name is Dirk Hontl. I'm, I'm VMware's Chief Open Source Officer. Been around open source for nearly 30 years, actually over 30 years now that I think about it. And you are? And I'm Linus. And uh, many of you may have seen the so-called Dirk and Linus show. Uh, I don't do speeches anymore. I, I hate doing that. So we tend to have this kind of fireside chat thing going where Dirk asks questions that he thinks you are interested in, and we'll see how that goes. Great throwing me under the bus. Thank you there. <laughs> and, and we have no artificial fire behind us this time, which I'm very thankful for. So uh, my, my first question is always the same, only the number changes. So 5.4 RC5, right. there's still a lot of churn. It's pretty big. Is this worrying? Is, are, we, are we on the right track? Is this a normal well, release? Um, it's, so 5.4 was actually odd because it was smaller than, than usual for the first few RCs. And, uh, and that's usually a good sign. It means that uh, we just didn't have a lot of churn and we didn't have a lot of changes that, that made people uh, find bugs. And then something happened last week, and last week we were back to normal and slightly above normal. And, uh, and it doesn't worry me because maybe there was a lull for some reason for a couple of weeks and now we're catching up. But this might be, if, if this trend continues, it might be one of those releases where we take an extra week uh, to make sure everything is calm and we've found all the problems. But there's nothing special and odd going on per se. It might just be a timing issue. But uh, talking about odd things, so in the last kernel release, we had this really odd bug where a change to a file system causes boot hangs on, uh, on some platforms. And we see a lot more of these complex, deep system interactions that are incredibly hard to debug. And is Linux as a system becoming so complex that the testability is, is starting to, to be worrisome? Um, I don't feel that. I, I feel that the fact that 5.3 had this very odd bug at the end that we just punted on and, and we solved it in the 5.4 release cycle, uh, I think that's more of a sign that we have fewer of the obvious bugs. So the bugs that then get noticed are just more subtle because we have better testing infrastructure, we have a lot better tools for both dynamic and, and static checking of the sources. Uh, and our process has been pretty good at uh, figuring out the, the obvious bugs long before they even hit my kernel. And that obviously then means that, that the bugs we do hit are often these subtle interactions between two subsystems, often things that only happen on certain platforms and certain hardware platforms and also certain usages. Um, it doesn't really, I think that's a good sign in, in general. It just means that, that we do the basics fairly well and then occasionally you hit something. It is a complex system, don't get me wrong. So there will be these interaction bugs that, that happen. But we, I mean, RT, real-time extensions, are finally almost merged, and yeah. we are talking about the end of the, the what is it, 10-year journey of getting this into oh, the it's kernel. been more than 10 years, but yes, no. <laughs> I was being generous. Um, but, and with that, we see uh, increased focus on using Linux in, in safety-critical systems, whether it's in cars or in avionics or whatnot. Uh, isn't this, this increased complexity and the, the subtlety of these bugs something that is worrying in the context of RT, in the context of safety-critical systems, where the more complex and the more non-deterministic a system is, the harder it becomes to actually trust it? The, Linux has always been fairly... I mean, any, any operating system, by definition, does complicated things. And... Uh, I don't think we've been getting worse. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually think uh, one of the things that makes me very happy is uh, how people are still looking in core detail at very core kernel code and doing changes and doing cleanup of code that has been around for decades by now. And 
when you say safety critical systems, one of the things that people don't always realize is that these safety critical systems tend to uh, do one thing and one thing only, the safety critical thing. And that means that the kind of bugs that we see in, on desktop systems in random distributions are things that you never would normally even hit in the embedded world in, in those safety critical systems because they do one thing that has been tested very, very, very well. And, and the kind of bugs we tend to find are the random crazy user bugs mm -hmm. where somebody does something that nobody even thought would be, would be remotely sane. Uh, and, and so the bugs we see are not bugs that I think would hit safety critical. So put words in your mouth. You're saying that um, the, the size of the community and the, the long experience with our development process is actually helping us, despite this complexity, yes. to create better software in the end. Also, uh, if you look at what happens now, the kernel I make is not the kernel that even the distributions use. So the, uh, the, the development kernel where we found a bug just before the 5.3 release is only the first step. Then we have Greg, who's here somewhere, uh, who is the second step, who does the, uh, the stable. stable kernels. The third step is the distro kernels that take the stable kernels, usually work their own testing on top of that, often have a few patches that they do for their customers, and then Way beyond that, you end up having all the people who actually do long-term stable stuff, like in automotive, mm -hmm. in industrial automation, and things like that. So there are, not only are we getting better on the development kernel side, we now, over the last many, many years, <laughs> we've had this process in place where you have multiple levels of filtering. So by the time it hits, it's a train, <laughs> not, not hopefully hitting a train, but by the time the system is installed in, in these industrial applications, they've gone through years of testing. So this really is a case where the, the size of this community and, and the long experience that we've had in how we actually uh, develop and then test what we do and maintain it over time is to the advantage even of these typically rather extreme use cases like right. real-time or, or safety critical computing. Yes, and, and one of the problems we see is that in some of the embedded world, uh, people are still working with kernels that are so old that the base kernel um, actually is from before we got all the processing in place and before we made our... 18. <clears throat> yes, exactly. So... <clears throat> so uh, some of the, the really long-term systems are using kernels that are very much inferior. Yeah. And, and we've actually improved on our stability and on our process and, and testing a lot in the last decade. So I think one other thing that is interesting for people to understand is what do you spend your time on as the kernel maintainer? Because I don't think a lot of people have insight in, into your workflow. What do you do? Um, I read email. I, I read email, I write email. Um, I do no coding at all anymore. Most of the code I write, I actually write inside my mail reader. So somebody sends me a patch, or more, more commonly they send me a pull request or there's a discussion about the next pull request and, and there's something I react to and say, no, um, this is fine, but and I send out pseudocode, or I, I'm so used to editing patches that I sometimes edit patches and send out the, the patch without having ever compiled it, ever tested it, because I literally wrote it in the mail reader and saying, I think this is how it should be done. But this is what I do. I, I'm not a programmer anymore. I, I read a lot more email than I write because what my job really is, um, in the end, my job is to say no. Uh, somebody, somebody has to be able to say no to people. And uh, 
because people, other developers know that if they do something bad, I will say no. Uh, they hopefully in turn are more careful. Uh, but in order to be able to say no, I have to know the background, because otherwise my no is my, I can't do my job. So I spend all my time basically reading email about what people are working on. I, I think you just de-glorified your job by quite a bit. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> on that very same vein, so what do you think the kernel developers should spend most of their time on at the other end of this pipeline? Um, so um, there's so many different levels of kernel developers. Uh, I see one of my primary goals to be very responsive to the sub-maintainers who send me patches or send me their pull requests. I want to feel like I can say yes or no within a day or two. During the merge window, the day or two may stretch into a week, uh, but I want to be there all the time. And, and that's, as a maintainer, I think that's one of the main things you want to do. You want to be responsive so that the people who are sending you code, either as patches or as pull requests, uh, feel like their work is maybe not appreciated, because sometimes it's not, let's be honest, <laughs> uh, but at least they get the feedback quickly so that they don't sit there wondering what's up. Uh, so that's one part from, from the managerial side is to be there all the time and be responsive. And it really is not very glorious. It's not a, uh, it is an interesting job, but you do end up spending most of your time reading email. On the developer side, what I hope people are doing is uh, trying to make not just good code, but these days we've been very good about having explanations for the code. So commit messages to me are almost as important as the code change itself. Right? Sometimes the code change is so obvious that no message is really required. But that is very, very rare. And, and so one of the things I hope developers are thinking about, the people who are actually writing code, is not just the code itself, but explaining why the code does something and why some change was needed. Because that then, in turn, helps the managerial side of the equation, where if you can explain your code to me, I will trust the code. And it also helps if, in three years, somebody else is trying to fix a bug, yes. and it looks at the change and says, what the heck is that? If you have a good commit message that explains why you did this, yeah. it's usually much easier to actually understand what's going on. A lot of open source, in general, is about communication. Yeah. I mean, and, and part of it is is the commit messages. Part of it is just the email going back and forth, communicating uh, what you're trying to do or communicating why something doesn't work for you uh, is really important. I, I think that's a very important message, that communication is key to all of this. I want to switch gear completely for a moment and, and talk a little bit about history. So your rather early memoir was titled Just for Fun. And if I look back at the early 90s when we started, uh, computers had four megabytes of RAM, meg megabytes with an M to those young people in the room. Um, a big hard drive was 100 megabytes. Um, and, and libraries were simple. The tools that you had were fairly simple. Uh, I remember when I first started Linux kernel development, I printed out the complete source code of the Linux kernel tree. I don't recommend doing this anymore. No. Um, <laughs> do you think for people starting today, it is as much fun, it's as easy to have fun and, and feel that you understand the space that you're in that it was 25, 28 years ago? I don't know. Um, I think in many respects, <coughs> excuse me, um, kernel development has gone much easier because, yes, it's bigger and more complicated, but on the other hand, we have much better tools and we have much better documentation. We have a, a lot more community where people 
there are lots of people who feel that it's part of their job, sometimes the primary part of their job, to help new people come into the community. So that all helps. There's also a lot less of the problems that stop you from, from even jumping into it. I mean, early on, you might not have the right hardware just because <laughs> the kernel would only work on, uh, on a very small subset of the hardware out, out there. And that just isn't a problem anymore. At the same time, it's clearly the case that the kernel has gotten huge and hugely more complicated. And, and the kind of immediate low-hanging fruit where, where new people can feel like they're they have something to work on might be not as easy to find. Yeah, I think the, yeah. the, the learning so. curve, the amount of things that you need to understand before you can do something, and that's not just about the Kong, that's about Kubernetes, about Docker, yeah. about anything in this space. It just feels to me that there is so much that you need to grasp of the environment before you can get really something done. Back then, you know, you sent a patch to Linus, he yelled at you, and, and life was good. Today, it's, it's, it's very different. But it, on the other hand, I mean, it's still the case that, I mean, almost nobody got started doing Linux by getting into some core kernel functionality. Almost all kernel developers started doing a small driver, doing something pretty small at the edges of the system. And, and the edges have grown. There's a lot more of those drivers that might have small annoyances there, where even if you don't know the system very well in general, you can find something very particular that you want to get into. And I used to say that nobody should get into kernel programming because there's all <laughs> these other open source projects that, that are easier to get into, but I think there's still a lot of people who are interested in interacting with hardware and are interested in the kind of problems that a kernel faces. And we still have a huge community and we still have a lot of new faces coming every re release. So, so things seem to be working very well and, and there are places to get, oh, I, get into development. I, and I wasn't uh, implying that things aren't working well. It just it feels to me, and, and that was my next question. So if you look at this transition from 1991, uh, tiny community, very, very basic in its functionality, let's, let's face it. When I started, there was no login prompt. You just got a root shell. Um, and, and then moving forward, I, I did at some point to you this switch for something that felt like just for fun a hobby project to something that was big business, that was mission-critical <laughs> software? Was there an inflection point where you said the nature of this project has changed? No, the nature of the problems have changed. And there's always been things that are not fun, right? When you hit your head against the wall for a week chasing a bug, that part is not fun and never has been. And that was always there. Um, there the kinds of things that are not fun these days are, tend to be different. I mean, these days, sometimes you have the CPU bugs. Uh, those are not fun with a capital N. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there's also what is maybe slightly not fun is we have to have a lot more rules in place. It was much more freewheeling mm -hmm. back in the days and, and, uh, and there, were, there was more banter and you could try things out without really worrying about breaking systems as much as you can these days. So th there, there is a lot of seriousness and, and some stuff that isn't fun, but the reason I'm still doing it is, uh, is the fun thing. I mean, I, so I, I may spend most of my time reading email, but part of uh, the reason I do that is I'd be really bored if I wasn't. Yeah, so I, I thought you might pick up on the change from 
early on you had the, the production kernel, the development kernel, the odd and even, and then with 2.6 we changed to a completely different development model, the one that we still have today with the 10 to 12 week release cycle. I, I would have assumed that you would pick that as kind of this transition from, we have this experimenting branch that is just for fun and then we, we get the release kernel, but you didn't no, perceive actually, it that way? I actually, uh, it turned out that the reason we switched to the modern model where we don't have an experimental kernel and a stable kernel was that old model was so much not fun uh, because <laughs> the experimental kernel was too experimental. It was, there was too much craziness going on that m most regular users would not want to touch it. And that meant that from a development standpoint, the, the, the experimental kernels were, <clears throat> were not that much fun to develop either because if you, well, this may be me. I feel like when I write code or when I'm a part of a project, I want that project to be meaningful to other people. Mm -hmm. If there are no users, what I do is not fun. And, uh, and that's the situation we were in uh, back in the 2.5 days, where, where users didn't dare use our experimental kernels because they were, they were too experimental. Yeah. And, and changing to a model where we have to be more careful uh, and we only integrate things when they are ready to be integrated actually made a lot of that go away. And it made our release cycle these days is so much more predictable and there's much less stress over that side that I actually think it's much more fun. Yeah. So in, in Jim's introduction, he pointed out 28 years of Linux, 15 years of Git, and he always forgets mentioning eight years of subsurface. Um, mm -hmm. The third most important open the source project. The third most important open source project, I agree. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, but isn't it time for a new project? No, 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 no. I am so done. Uh, <laughs> I'm very happy with how Git ended up, but I, every time Git is mentioned, I want to make it all very, very obvious that I maintained Git for six months and no more. And it's been 15 years, and the real credit goes to Junio Hamano yeah. and, and a lot of other Git developers. Uh, I, I'll take credit for the design, and, and the thing that makes me happy about Git it's not that it's, it's taken over the world, it's that we all have self-doubt, right? We all think, are we actually any good? And one of the self-doubts I had with Linux was, it was just a re-implementation of Unix, right? Can I do something that isn't just a better version of something else? And, and Git proved that, yes, I can. Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, and, and that, to me, having, having two projects that made a big splash means that I'm not, three projects, uh, means that I'm not like this one-hit wonder. And that to makes to those happy. in the audience who don't get the joke, so the third project subsurface is one that I now maintain, so I, I keep trying to talk it up, but it's okay. Um, so so uh, we have only a couple of minutes left. A few years ago, you started using code names for the development kernels. And in the new release of RC5, you changed the code name of the current kernel. Uh, can, you, can you talk about I, that? I've used the, how many in the audience know that kernels don't only have version numbers, they have names, too? Let's see, see most, most people know. Yeah. So it's not just a few years ago. I've done this since way before 1.0. The kernels have always, in the main top-level make file, there's a name variable that gets set. And it's usually a random creature. Uh, I, where I live, there was this one squirrel that kept running in front of my car for a week. And, and so I named the kernel Suicidal Squirrel. And, and the name is not used anywhere. It's literally just a variable that gets set and then never, ever used again. But it's, it's been this ongoing joke for me for the last 20-plus years. And I think Greg names his stable kernels, too. Uh, and I, if something happens, 
either in the news or, or in my personal life, you can sometimes see it in the name change. So the last release on Sunday, name change to kleptomaniac octopus. Because we were diving, this is what Dirk was aiming for. We were diving and playing with an octopus, and uh, two different octopus. And the first one tried to steal my flashlight, and the second one tried to steal Dirk's camera. And the picture of so, that, if you look at my Twitter handle um, that was up a moment yeah. ago, I, I actually posted a picture of that. It's, so, it's pretty hilarious when the octopus goes for my camera. So the name has absolutely no meaning, but sometimes you can guess that, oh, something happened in Linus's life where some, <laughs> some random animal did something silly. Right. Okay, so we are out of time. So the, the most important party, uh, parting question, as always, where should the 30-year celebration for Linux be? So where should Angela host those conferences? Oh. It's only a couple of years. It's only a couple of years. Um, Helsinki? No, I'm, I'm thinking... I'm thinking diving. Um, <laughs> Hawaii, I've done. So Tahiti in, in a couple of years, maybe. On, on that happy note, thank you, everyone. Thank you.